How does the food you eat contribute to your health? Do supplements help prevent disease? For the past 25 years, the Linus Pauling Institute has served as a world-renowned research center at Oregon State University. Our mission is to promote optimal health through cutting-edge nutrition research and trusted public outreach. We use a synergistic strategy, connecting several scientific fields to bring a better understanding to dietary components and the role that they play in obtaining optimal health. We provide that information to the world, allowing people everywhere to live longer, better lives. Welcome to the Linus Pauling Institute's webinar series. Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Trout. Mice, rats, and humans all agree Brussels sprouts can prevent cancer. My name is Dr. Alexander Michaels, and I am the communications officer for the Linus Pauling Institute. And it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to the Linus Pauling Institute's second webcast of 2022. This one is on cruciferous vegetables and cancer. I'm not going to waste too much time with introductions today uh, to the Institute, but I would like to get going on to the webinar as soon as possible. Um, so, uh, But before I do so, I'd like to invite Dr. Emily Ho, Director of the Linus Pauling Institute, and uh, to give a welcome and to everyone and say hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Uh, today it's on Brussels sprouts and cancer prevention with my good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Dave Williams. Uh, Dr. Williams and I have been longtime partners in crime in all things cancer and cruciferous vegetables. Uh, we work on slightly different compounds and different aspects of cancer, but Dr. Williams and I have been working together for many years around the science of a healthy diet um, that reduces your cancer risk. Uh, with the great turnout that we had at my broccoli webinar uh, last December, I thought it'd be a great idea to bring Dr. Williams um, here in this forum to talk about other aspects of cruciferous vegetables and health. Um, just a side note, if you haven't seen my webinar on broccoli, um, it's available on our uh, YouTube channel and we'll send out that link uh, after the webinar is over so you can recheck it out if you want to. Um, we'll be, uh, we also have information about it in our newsletter that hopefully you've seen uh, come to your mailboxes and your uh, emails recently. So I'll be back um, in a bit, but for now I'm going to hand it back to Alex and uh, he'll give us a rundown on the webinar and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Emily, for that introduction. Um, Dr. Williams is a going to give approximately a 20-minute-ish presentation, and then we'll open this up. Uh, for a Q&A session. The goal is to wrap up the webinar today in a little less than an hour now, so about noon Pacific time, uh, just for everyone's information. I do want to mention, though, that there is a Q&A tab uh, available in Zoom down below me in the middle of the screen here. Um, unlike our previous webinars, we did not collect questions in advance, so we're counting on all of you to fill up that Q&A section with questions that you might have on uh, Dr. Williams' presentation or on cruciferous vegetables and cancer in general. Um, if you do have any questions, just type them in the Q&A tab below and it, you can do this at any time. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we'll, we'll be monitoring it continuously throughout the, the webinar today. However, we will not be monitoring the chat. The chat should be disabled for participants. Please do not try to type anything in the chat. Use the Q&A section instead. Um, and during the Q&A, Dr. Ho will be asking the questions of the, the speaker today about more on that in, when the time comes. So let's get to it. As I've already said, our, um, our speaker today is Dr. David E. Williams. Dr. Williams has been part of the Lions Pauling Institute pretty much since it came to Oregon State in 1996. Um, he was actually here before the Institute. He earned his PhD here at Oregon State University in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics, the same place I earned my PhD. Uh, and for his postdoctoral training, he moved out to Wisconsin, but he missed Wisconsin or Oregon so much he came back. And so when he returned to OSU, he, he, he has his tenure track professor uh, position, um, conducting biomedical research on drug metabolism, carcinogenesis, and cancer chemo prevention in the Department of Environmental and Molecular Toxicology. When the Lyons Pauling Institute came in 1996, when it moved up here from Palo Alto, 
uh, he was among the first to get involved. Uh, Dr. Williams is an Oregon State University Distinguished Professor. He is also the Helen P. Rumble Professor for Cancer Prevention in the Linus Pauling Institute. He has maintained continuous external funding for uh, over 33 years at the at OSU, primarily by NIEHS and NCI, and has authored um, 240 peer-reviewed publications with over 15,000 citations. Uh, at OSU, he has served as director of, for three large multi-investigator, multi-institutional programs, and he has been an external advisor for numerous programs, including the NIEHS Center for Children's Environmental Health, the NIEHS Centers for the Study of Human Health at the Impact of the Gulf Oil Spill, the uh, and, and IEH Superfund programs, and the Institute for Environmental Health at Oregon State, uh, Health, Oregon Health and Sciences University, OHSU, uh, and many, many others that I did not mention. Um, <clears throat> during his time at the Institute, Dr. Williams has worked with Dr. Bailey, Dr. Dashwood, and Dr. Ho on our cancel ke cancer chemo prevention program. One notable accomplishment he mentioned, aside from those mentioned that I just mentioned uh, a moment ago, was that he was co-author on a review with the with these uh, a few others at the Institute called Cruciferous Vegetables and Human Cancer Risk, Epidemiologic, <laughs> Epidemiologic, evidence and mechanistic basis and now has been cited over 1500 times in the literature. And here I thought he was going to mention his Time magazine cover article about prenatal carcinogen exposure. That's also a notable accomplishment. So let's start the presentation from Dr. Williams. webinar uh, by the Linus Pauling Institute looking at the role of, of cruciferous vegetables, uh, specifically Brussels sprouts and indoles from cruciferous vegetables on, on uh, prevention of cancer. The uh, reason that this is so important is that uh, if you look at the success we've had in reduction of mortality from chronic disease over the last 50 years, you can see we've had a lot of success with heart disease, uh, cerebral vascular disease, pneumonia, influenza, and almost no effect on, on cancer mortalities. And, and so why is that? If you look at the causes of cancer associated with cancer, this was some work done by uh, Dole and Pito uh, from the UK uh, a number of years ago now. It's not surprising to see smoking listed as a uh, major contributor to, to cancer, but uh, I think people were somewhat surprised initially that diet was playing such a major had such a major factor in, in susceptibility of, of populations to cancer, and, and probably also somewhat surprised that the low percentage of, of occupational exposures and pollution uh, that was attributed to uh, cancer rates. As an example of, of dietary uh, differences, um, the Japanese uh, have a markedly higher intake of preserved vegetables in their diet than, than we do, about 55 grams per day, as, and, uh, as opposed to less than 12 grams uh, by Americans. And so. Some people have estimated that if we were able to increase this from an average of less than a serving per week to at least three, well, we could achieve a 70% decrease in, in, in some cancer. So uh, I'm going to talk about one source of phytochemicals uh, and whole foods that provide protection against uh, cancers. And they're compounds in cruciferous vegetables called uh, glucosinolates. Uh, glucobrassicin is the precursor for the indoles and uh, glucoraphanin uh, for sulforaphane, which has been studied for uh, years by uh, Dr. Ho here at the Alliance Pauling Institute. There's an enzyme that's uh, freed up when the cells are broken called myrosinase, which cleaves off the glucose and in the case of glucobrassicin, generates this indole, indole free carbonyl. This compound is unstable in acids, so when you take it orally, it produces a, a number of conjugation products. And the major one, in fact, the only one that's seen in the blood of most people and individuals after dosing, he has this, com this dimer called DIM, uh, which is 3,3-dienolmethane. And DIM has now uh, actually become a, a popular dietary supplement. One of the recommendations from agencies like the American Institute for Cancer Research for reducing uh, your risk for cancer, uh, a number of these are, are obviously uh, important, uh, especially the one about the, uh, no tobacco use. But I take some issue with this number eight, this don't use supplements for breast cancer. I would modify this statement to read, don't use uh, solely dietary supplements to protect against cancer. Uh, I think uh, uh, supplements have a role in addition to, to uh, beneficial whole foods in preventing cancer. And I, will, I hope I can convince you of that. 
uh, rainbow trout turn out to be an exquisitely sensitive animal for uh, an important dietary uh, carcinogen, and that's aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is produced by a mold that grows on corn uh, that's stored uh, in hot, humid conditions after harvesting. And this mold produces, uh, uh, this aflatoxin is formed by this mold, and the uh, Inter International Agency for Research on Cancer have classified this as a known, as a known human carcinogen, their highest uh, ranking for risk. Liver cancer uh, is, is important. Uh, it's one of the few cancers that's actually increasing over the, the recent past. It's the, in some parts of the world, the parts of the world that have high uh, levels of aflatoxin in their diet, it can be the number one cause of death in males. So it, the levels of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma are incredibly high there. So uh, the trout is a good model because uh, it's meta aflatoxin is metabolized the same way. As in humans, you get the same DNA addicts, same mutations, and the same cancer. Uh, when we gave endothricarbonyl in the diet to trout, we found a marked reduction in uh, liver cancer uh, when they were given aflatoxin. And the mechanism, which we studied for, for quite a while, uh, George Bailey and, and Rod Dashwood, uh, who were members of the Elias Pauling Institute for years, uh, helped uh, work out the mechanism for, for this. And uh, it seems to be that endothricarbonyl uh, is increasing uh, the rate of uh, uh, metabolic detoxication because aflatoxin, like many environmental carcinogens we're exposed to, uh, is not carcinogenic in itself and needs to be metabolized to uh, a reactive metabolite. In this case, it's, a, it's an epoxide. And so, uh, endo 3 carbonyl diet increases the protective detoxication routes and inhibits the uh, activation routes uh, and the, the binding of this epoxide to DNA. So, this is how endo 3 carbonyl appears to be providing this protection. So uh, I've also been interested over the years in uh, another class of environmental carcinogens uh, that are important uh, in our diet and, and also in the air we breathe, and that are polycyclic, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or pHs. These are produced uh, from the incomplete combustion of a lot of different carbon materials, including coal, diesel, petroleum, tobacco. Uh, and uh, a number of them have also been ranked by IARC as, as known human carcinogens. And I became interested, too, in, in the sensitivity of uh, 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 the fetus and the infant, so uh, early development, uh, to these uh, carcinogens. There were some studies done by a group in Columbia where they had pregnant women in Manhattan wear uh, these air samplers, so they, they knew how many, how, what their exposure to pHs in the air was, uh, and they measured uh, pHs in their blood uh, and DNA addicts in their cord blood, and, and then uh, uh, metabolites in their in their uh, offspring, and you can see that there was a lot of evidence for uh, exposures. So, what was the impact? Well, they followed followed some of these children up eight, ten years of age, and there's a, a solid evidence that uh, uh, children born to women with uh, higher doses of pHs during pregnancy had a significant reduction in in IQ, and that's uh, uh, quite well accepted now. There's also some more recent evidence, uh, and, and not as much for the effect of neurocognitive impacts uh, like IQ. But with autism, uh, women that uh, live closer to the freeways, and again, uh, diesel and gasoline burning is, is a big source. The ones that live the closest to uh, the freeway and, and had higher exposures uh, had an increased risk for their children developing autism. And so uh, what about cancer? That's what I was interested in as far as uh, fetal and infant exposure to, to uh, these carcinogens. So, the question I wanted to ask was, we know that we can protect the adult animal from exposure, developing cancer after exposure to these chemical carcinogens. Can we provide protection to the fetus by giving uh, the mother uh, these phytochemicals uh, during her pregnancy? And so uh, I, we developed a model where uh, a pregnant mouse was dosed with uh, a PAH uh, during uh, the pregnancy, and they were fed either control diet or indole 3 carbonyl diet. We also did some work with green tea and, and chlorophyll, but I don't have time to get into that uh, now. Uh, the offspring that were born to mothers treated with this pH uh, started to, to uh, exhibit mortality from a very severe uh, T cell lymphoblastic leukemia when they were only three months of age. Uh, and they also developed lung cancer, and the survivors developed lung cancer um, at uh, 10 months of age. If the offspring were born to mothers that had endo 3 carbonyl like diet, you could see that there was a significant protection. Uh, for those offspring, and the only endo 3 carbonyl they were they were uh, exposed to was in utero because they were not fed endo 3 carbonyl after weaning. So it's only the 
maternal exposures that are having this impact uh, on the offspring later in life, which I found really uh, quite striking. And the mechanism seems to be somewhat similar to with aflatoxin. It increases uh, the rate of detoxication of this pH and uh, blocks the uh, bioactivation to a DNA binding uh, uh, metabolite that causes the cancer. We then wanted to look at, at humans, of course, because that's really what the question is. And, and the dilemma here is, first of all, you can't give chemical carcinogens to, to people. That's not ethical. So, um, but how do, you, how do you develop the risk uh, for humans? I mean, regulatory agencies are charged with coming up with the, the dose of uh, a chemical carcinogen that would not produce uh, more than one cancer in a million people. Sometimes it's one cancer in 100,000 people. And how do they do that? Well, they, they have to use animal data. Uh, and the animal data, uh, some of the best experiments, uh, you're looking at uh, the dose that produces one cancer in 10. So how do you go from the dose that produces one cancer in 10 down to the dose that will produce one cancer in a million? Well, uh, the agencies uh, use what's called a linear extrapolated dose. So they take that uh, dose response uh, uh, up at the uh, at the higher dose and they extrapolate uh, down to uh, one in a million and with, with a linear line. And is that accurate? Uh, you know, extrapolating across uh, over 100,000 fold difference in dose. Maybe it's linear, maybe it's uh, sublinear, maybe it's superlinear. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty, of course, there. So we, we, uh, we actually were able to conduct a study dosing humans with chemical carcinogens. And we were able to do this with the incredible sensitivity of this instrument at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory called Accelerator Mass Spectrometer. Um, we could uh, do the study, uh, a complete metabolite study, pharmacokinetic study over 48 hours, urine and blood, uh, after a dose of uh, 50 nanograms of C14 benzpyrene. And that's 10 times lower uh, than the average uh, daily dietary exposure uh, in the US uh, for non-smokers. So, uh, we're not uh, significantly increasing the, the average uh, uh, dose. Uh, so uh, the FDA was convinced this was a de minimis risk uh, experiment and they gave us an IND approval. And the IRB is also uh, at Oregon State and Lawrence Livermore uh, gave their approvals too. You can find the <coughs> complete description of this uh, uh, trial uh, at the uh, website uh, uh, for clinicaltrials.gov. And this is, the, uh, this is the, the number for that trial. So uh, this is the, these are the instruments they use down at Lawrence Livermore. This is the old one. Uh, the first one they use, it's a, a 10 mega uh, volt uh, instrument. It's about as big as a submarine. Uh, it takes up this whole room. They were able to, to uh, develop a one megavolt instrument and then finally a, a 250 kilovolt instrument. And what was even more beneficial for these kinds of studies was they were able to couple it to a, a UPLC, which is a device to separate out uh, metabolites from parent compounds. With, the, with these instruments, you could only look at total C14, but you didn't know the chemical identity. And with UPLC, you can separate the chemicals out, then put them into the, the instrument, and, and so you can measure the C14 in individual metabolites. To uh, get an idea of the incredible sensitivity of this instrument, the limit of quantitation in our UPLC uh, AMS study was uh, 0.6 femtograms per ml plasma or six times 10 to the minus 16th grams per ml, which is uh, an incredible number. Uh, if, you, if you put that in, uh, in volume equivalents, it's a drop of water in 40,000 Olympic size swimming pool, or an inch in 283 trips to the sun, if you want to look at distance, or time, it's one second in 500 million years. So you can see this is one of the reasons why we can do it uh, in uh, what we felt was a safe manner, because it's incredibly uh, small amounts. Yeah. So uh, what, what was the study and what did we see? So uh, we were dosing uh, humans with 50 nanograms of C14 benzpyrene and uh, either on a, a chemically known diet, we had dietary questionnaires and we had them refrain from uh, foods with high levels of benzpyrene and, and also refrain from cruciferous vegetables. And uh, so either those defined diets, not defined diet, but either known diets or uh, diets in which they supplemented with 50 grams a day of uh, lightly steamed Brussels sprouts, or uh, 150 milligrams of the benzpyrene of the DIM supplement uh, twice daily. And uh, this, this is a total of C14 uh, over time in, in blood. 
And you can see that uh, there's a marked reduction in the blood levels uh, if the individuals had uh, had a week on Brussels sprouts or DIM. And more, more specifically, we looked at the metabolites that were uh, known to be associated with cancer risk. Um, and uh, so this is uh, the, uh, for each individual, each of these six people, uh, the amount of these reactive metabolites uh, before and then after uh, either Brussels sprouts or DIM. And you can see that uh, for four out of the six people, there was a marked reduction, uh, two to five fold in their formation of these carcinogenic metabolites uh, in blood. Uh, and uh, one out of six actually uh, showed a slight increase and another was essentially unchanged. Uh, we don't know what accounts for this wide uh, individual variability. It may be uh, uh, genetic, so we're not sure, but it's not uncommon to see this kind of thing in, in uh, even clinical trials, this wide variation. And we had a small population to look at. So uh, some of the questions uh, to be addressed now, what's the long-term uh, supplementation like with respect to safety? What's the relative efficacy of supplement versus the whole food? Do we have concerns about potential adverse drug supplement reactions? In the future, can we design a specific nutraceutical treatment uh, regime for individuals like they're trying to do with personalized medicine with pharmaceuticals? So um, uh, these are the questions that I think are important to look at in the future. We know uh, with respect to safety uh, with rodent and actually human studies that there appears to be, uh, they, they appear to be safe. We fed mice 150 parts per million endothelial carbonyl from the time of weaning to eight months of age. That's about 375 uh, milligrams per kilogram body weight and saw no toxicity. In fact, we saw a significant reduction in liver cancer uh, in the animals who were treated with this liver carcinogen, dihylomitrosamine. Uh, we did a study in rats where we fed uh, 50 mg per kg endothelial carbonyl or two different doses of DIM, two or, or 20 mg per kg uh, daily and, and out to 12 months of age and we saw no evidence of toxicity. Uh, the group from Arizona, uh, University of Arizona, uh, and uh, Dr. Ho is uh, associated with this study and, and with this group of uh, collaborators at, at Arizona, they, they supplemented women with uh, 300 milligrams of, of uh, DIM uh, daily for uh, 12 months, and that works out to be about four mix per kg, uh, and saw no adverse uh, effects. Uh, there is a caveat here that uh, although there were no uh, adverse effects observed. One thing that was seen was that uh, uh, treatment with animals with endothelial carbonyl or DIM or, or women with DIM, there seems to be uh, an introduction of, of some uh, enzyme, CYP1A1 and CYP1A2. Uh, so that raises the possibility there could be some possible drug supplement interactions. So we need to, to know what that, that, that possibility uh, is, the risk might be. Uh, and I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, the, what's the relative efficacy of supplement versus whole food? Well, we tried to address this question by, again, in this uh, mouse transposonal model, by giving them either uh, 500 parts per million of the pure endothelial carbonyl or 10% uh, uh, of the diet of broccoli sprouts or, or Brussels sprouts. And we were actually quite surprised to see that, uh, again, we saw the protection, as we always do with uh, endothelial carbonyl, uh, but the uh, uh, offspring born to mothers that were getting uh, the Brussels sprouts or broccoli sprout powder in their diet had enhanced mortality, uh, again, which is a big surprise. And we don't really know why this is. It may be this high dose. I mean, 10%, of course, is, is a high dose of a uh, whole food like that. Uh, maybe it has something to do with it. Or maybe uh, it's carcinogenic specific. Uh, maybe if we had a different transplacental carcinogen, we wouldn't see this kind of effect. So, Unfortunately, we haven't been able to follow up on this really, but this is an important question and one that that uh, many people are concerned with in this field is, is what is the benefit of the phytochemical that's known to be in uh, whole food versus the whole food itself. When we, we calculated the amount of whole food Brussels sprouts you'd have to eat every day to get uh, the levels of endothelial carbon and DIM that were effective uh, in preventing cancer in this model, you'd have to consume uh, three and a half to 200 packages, uh, this package is a 10 ounce package, of Brussels sprouts every day to get the amount of uh, endothelial carbonyl. So uh, it's just not possible to do that in this case with the whole food, but you certainly can with, with the supplement. So uh, back to this uh, potential for adverse uh, drug supplement reactions. Why, why are we worried about this? Well, with drug drug interactions, uh, it's the number one uh, cause for emergency room admissions. And, and there are 2 million cases a year with over 100,000 deaths. And half of all liver failures are associated with 
adverse drug drug interactions. And as we age, we're taking more medications. And as we do, the risk goes up. Uh, so that if you're taking eight medications, which is not unusual in elderly people, uh, you, there's a 90% chance you could have a drug drug interaction. And with respect to nutraceutical drug interactions, we know of certainly of cases like that. And one of the best known is, is grapefruit juice. Uh, you know uh, that if you're taking certain drugs, there's actually a label on uh, things like statins uh, telling you not to take with uh, grapefruit juice uh, because the grapefruit juice is an excellent inhibitor of this uh, enzyme in your liver called cytochrome P453A4. And 3A4 metabolizes statins and a number of other drugs. So if you uh, take endo 3 uh, I mean, if you take uh, grapefruit juice uh, along with the drug, what happens is you're inhibiting the metabolism of the drug and the parent compound, the lovastatin in this case, the statin builds up to eight times the level in your blood that it would if you uh, had not consumed the grapefruit juice. And in some cases, this can result in, again, adverse uh, drug-drug interactions or in, in some cases, serious toxicities and maybe even liver failure. Uh, so uh, they, so here's another example of a potential uh, uh, food, uh, phytochemical, uh, drug interaction and, and also the effect of genetics. Uh, we know that uh, there's a severe uh, epidemic of uh, opioid uh, toxicities in, in, this U, in the U.S. <clears throat> and OxyContin is metabolized by uh, that same enzyme that's inhibited by grapefruit juice, this CYP3A4, to an inactive metabolite. Um, it's activated by a different enzyme called 2D6 in your liver, and it forms a much more active metabolite. And it turns out that 2D6 activity is very tightly associated with your genetics, with your genotype. There are well over 100 allelic variants uh, of this 2D6 that result in either no uh, active uh, enzyme, uh, intermediate activity, normal activity, or ultra activity because 2D6 has undergone some gene duplication. So you can have two copies or you could have 12 copies of the active enzyme. So those are the ultra metabolizers. So, if you take OxyContin with uh, grapefruit juice, you're going to slow the inactivation and you're going to build up higher levels of OxyContin and could have unwanted uh, effects. Uh, at the same time, if you are a, a 2D6 ultra metabolizer, uh, this, uh, this activation to the oxymorphone is, is driven uh, rapidly and extensively. So uh, you're inhibiting inactivation and driving this uh, activation to a toxic uh, are more active metabolites, so you could easily get a uh, drug overdose here. So this is one of the kinds of things you have to be uh, concerned with uh, uh, when you are thinking about uh, nutraceuticals uh, and genotype and and uh, the drugs. So uh, can we in the future design a specific uh, nutraceutical uh, regime uh, for, in, for an individual to target a specific health effect? This is the way uh, personalized medicine is going. They're trying to develop the optimal dose. Of, that's what Linus Pauling always believed in, the optimum uh, dose of uh, the optimum chemical at the optimum time. Uh, and uh, uh, to do that, we need to know the action of the uh, nutraceuticals, uh, the genotype of an individual, uh, of the metabolism of nutraceuticals, uh, the genotype of the protein targets, uh, as well as other environmental factors that are important in, in this uh, diet, other drugs, pollutants. Uh, and then uh, hopefully in the future, we can use all this information to come up with the optimum compound for an individual for a specific effect, protecting against cancer or heart disease or whatever. Uh, and uh, I think that's where we're going in the future. And hopefully 25, 50 years from now, maybe sooner than that, uh, we'll, we'll be there. We can, we can make that kind of determination. That's, that's, uh, I'm optimistic that, that uh, we're going to get there. I just wanted to point this out real quickly. And, uh, of course, being a Linus Pauling student, I am very cognizant of, of, of the, the uh, legacy of, of Dr. Uh, Pauling and, and, of course, his work with, with vitamin C. And endocrine actually combines with, with vitamin C and in your body and forms this compound called, called ascorbogen. And uh, although this, this compound has been understudied, I think uh, there is uh, Good evidence that it uh, protects can, could protect against disease through a number of di different mechanisms. And I think that's one area of study that that has some promise for the future. Now, uh, I can't possibly thank uh, everybody over the, over the last 35, 40 years that have helped with these studies. Uh, but these are just uh, some of these individuals. Of course, uh, I'm very indebted to the NIH for 
support throughout the years. And I want to thank you for, for your time and, and your attention. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for that presentation, Dr. Williams. Uh, the, I, I know that was a lot of information coming very quickly. And so I think uh, if, if you, you want some clarification on certain points, we obviously the Q&A is available and we're gonna start that Q&A session pretty darn soon. Um, but if you also want copies of the slides, a couple of people have already asked for uh, copies of the slides, just let us know at LPI uh, dot, or sorry, LPI at OregonState.edu and we'll make those available. So before we move on to the Q&A section, I just wanted to let everybody know that this webinar comes on the precipice of Damn Proud Day, uh, which is up here in my background. Damn Proud Day is the annual day of giving for Oregon State University, uh, and it just happens to be happening next week. This is our Damn Proud Day uh, webinar. So Emily, would you like to give us a little bit more information on that day? Sure, thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you, Dr. Williams, for a great talk. Um, but I did want to talk a little bit about Damn Proud Day. Um, it's a day of giving at OSU, and it's presenting uh, a once-in-a-year opportunity for the Lions Calling Institute. Um, so today and on every day up to April 27th, um, gifts uh, given to the Institute uh, make us eligible for additional matching support from many other uh, generous donors to the university. Uh, we also have our Institute's director circle, um, who have also made um, some special matching gifts available. Um, I myself has also done a match as well, uh, but all these together help us reach our fundraising goals and we need your help uh, to get us there. Um, if you appreciate these webinars um, that have been uh, that have um, and been ongoing from the Institute. Um, we ask that you consider a donation to our research um, and outreach programs um, on Damn Proud Day. Um, you just heard uh, about our research, um, our outreach pro programs, uh, like our webinars today, um, like the Micronutrient Information Center, are really primarily funded by the generosity of donors like you. So uh, without your support, we could not bring you uh, programming like this, uh, science, evidence-based information, and connect you with some of the world's uh, leaders in topics of optimal health. Um, so we're going to drop a link uh, to give um, in the chat right now. Um, please consider um, showing your support or at least telling your friends um, about it as well if you're not able to. So thank you uh, for taking part and uh, we will move forward in terms of answering some of your questions. Yeah, um, and for those of you who can't see the link in the chat, I just wanted to say it's lpi.pub slash damnproud, uh, D-A-M-P-R-O-U-D. Um, and we'll send that link out to everybody um, when we uh, follow up with the video recording of this webinar. Um, but now we're gonna move on to the Q&A. I would like to remind everyone to keep typing in your questions to the Q&A section. We are continuing to monitor those. Um, I want to mention though something really quick is that we have some ground rules on questions that we are going to answer. Uh, the Lions Pauling Institute is not a medical institution and so we will not be answering any questions about specific medical issues that you might have. Um, for example, a cancer diagnosis or um, another a diagnosis of another disease, but we can answer general questions about theoretical applications for DIM, for example, or um, we can answer some uh, you know, theoretical questions about cancer in general, but just not the specifics. So with that, uh, let's start. Um, Dave, if you want to turn your camera and Emily, take it away. All right, we've got lots of questions in different areas. Um, I, I wanna back up to a question that was early on. We were talking about um, aflatoxin exposures, um, especially uh, and risk of cancer. Um, so there was a question in terms of whether or not that's an issue in the United States um, and whether or not things like, you know, eating lots of peanut butter um, and peanut products are gonna be uh, a risk factor for cancer. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the good news is that uh, because of our uh, the better conditions we have for post harvest storage of of uh, crops that are, are subject to this uh, this uh, mold that grows on uh, corn and peanuts, uh, we have nowhere near the problem that they do in in parts of China. Uh, but there has been some association with elevated levels uh, in 
peanuts, especially in the Southeast. And more recently uh, with uh, corn tortillas in, in uh, uh, South Texas uh, that seem to be increasing for whatever reason. The levels the FDA allows, for example, in peanut butter are 20 parts per billion. That would be uh, 20 nanograms per, per gram of peanut butter. And uh, so our exposures are uh, uh, right now uh, lower than, than uh, a lot lower than, than they are in parts of the world where liver cancer is, is uh, really epidemic. Um, there are also, thank you for that. Um, Quite a few questions in the area of what should we be eating or taking. Uh, so comparison in terms of how much Brussels sprouts we would need to eat um, versus taking I3C versus taking DIM. Now, are there differences? Is one better than the other? Um, food source or synthetic sources? You have any general comments on on? that range of, I know that's a big question. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, well, I am I hope I didn't leave you with the impression that I'm uh, in favor of replacing whole foods with supplements. That's not it at all. Uh, I just think that supplements can play a role. As I mentioned at the end of the seminar, what the goal really is, is to the, figure out what the best uh, uh, supplement or whole food uh, would be for uh, you as an individual. We're not anywhere near there yet. So as a, just as a general rule, uh, going by the guidelines of uh, some of the cancer institutes and uh, FDA, et cetera, uh, three servings of uh, cruciferous vegetables a week would, be, uh, would probably be optimal if you can work that into your diet, which actually shouldn't be too hard given the, the number of different uh, foods that contain uh, these compounds, uh, kale, uh, cabbage, broccoli, uh, cauliflower, uh, arugula. There's, there's just so many that you could use in your diet. And uh, so I'm, I'm a proponent of that. Uh, with respect to indole 3 carbonyl and DIM supplements, uh, it, it never really made sense to me to really uh, focus on indole 3 carbonyl as a supplement because it all gets converted to dim uh, in your stomach anyway. Uh, so I, I, I do favor dim supplements. In fact, I take a dim supplement. I take 100 milligrams a day. Uh, I don't want to uh, uh, put in a, uh, a plug for a particular company, but there are some supplements out there that uh, have ingredients incorporated that help with the absorption uh, because uh, DIM is not that well absorbed and else, and else it's in a, a matrix of, of lipid and other things that help it cross the, uh, in, uh, the stomach and get to the bloodstream. But all of these things have a role to play. And, but as of now, if you ask me how, how many uh, servings of Brussels sprouts versus other foods versus uh, taking DIM, I, I couldn't come up with a number. They all play a role and, and I'm a big believer in the benefits of whole foods. So, I, again, I hope I didn't give that impression that I'm not. No, that's great. Um, speaking, I guess, of other foods, can you talk a little bit about, um, I guess, different cruciferous vegetables? Um, are they all the same in terms of I3C content? Um, there was a question about, you know, what about radishes or other cruciferous vegetables? Um, how do they come into play here? Yeah, the the crucifer family is, has got such a wide uh, variation in the chemical makeup of these glucosinolates. There's well over a hundred different glucosinolates identified now in the crucifer vegetable family. So, uh, and, and only a few of them have been studied, probably the most, the two most studied, of course, are, are broccoli and sulforaphane and uh, uh, Brussels sprouts and milk carbonyl. Those are the two that really have had the most focus, but uh, there are, uh, lots of others uh, in these uh, other members of the cruciferous vegetable family. And again, we don't know a lot of, about them. We do know the chemical structures of a number of them, but as far as their health benefits, not so much. Um, there are also, uh, in terms of uh, impact in humans, are there clinical trials with either the foods um, uh, or, or the supplements that, uh, that you know about? 
Yes, there have been dozens of clinical trials uh, with both the whole food and with uh, indel 3 carbonyl and or DIM. Uh, you can find those if you go to that clinicaltrials.gov website, they list all the, the trials because you, you are required when you conduct a trial just to, to register that at clinicaltrials.gov. And so there's a complete description of the study, uh, many times what the, well, the endpoints and the doses they were given of, uh, and what the outcome uh, was in many cases, or if they're completed studies. So uh, the answer is yes, there are a lot of clinical trials that have been done. The ones that have been done with indole through carbonyl or DIM uh, have been pretty promising for uh, a number of cancers and, and uh, colorectal breast, uh, uh, among others. Uh, the result with cruciferous vegetables has not been as consistently impressive. Um, the majority of studies have shown a beneficial effect, but uh, not all of them. So. Uh, but there are a lot of factors that could go into that. Again, pro probably the biggest one is the dose. How much did they consume? Mm -hmm. That's really promising. Um, there was a question specifically around DIM supplements and, and breast cancer. And I think, especially since um, a lot of people are taking DIM supplements for some of the estrogenic activity to help with hot flashes um, and that type of thing. Uh, do you have any uh, comment in terms of um, potential benefit or harm uh, with DIM supplements and, and breast cancer? Uh, yeah, breast cancer has been one of the ones that have been most studied uh, with DIM. And that's because the mechanism that's been worked out by Dr. Ho and others uh, has been uh, that DIM induces an enzyme. Uh, it's the same enzyme uh, in your liver as in breast tissue, it's called cytochrome P450-1A2, and it metabolizes estradiol to a uh, non-estrogenic metabolite. Uh, so when you take DIM, uh, you can increase the metabolism, lower the total levels of estrogen, and uh, that's beneficial, of course, for uh, breast cancers that are uh, estrogen responsive. If they become estrogen non-responsive, then maybe not so much. Um, getting back to the food, there are some questions about how cooking uh, may affect uh, the, the bioactives that you're studying. Yeah, and that's a really important issue because uh, people sometimes don't realize this, but if you go back to, remember that slide I showed early on about how these were formed, the enzyme myrosinase is critical to uh, cleave off the uh, active phytochemical from the glucosinolate. And this enzyme uh, is, like a lot of enzymes, is, is degraded by heat. So uh, the longer you cook uh, the Brussels sprouts or broccoli or whatever, uh, the more this enzyme is going to be deactivated and the less of the sulforaphane or the indole 3 carbonyl you're going to release. And, and so it decreases the benefit. What we had people do uh, to allow some cooking, but a minimal uh, degradation of the enzyme uh, was two minutes of light steaming. And that seemed to be just fine. Uh, there is some bacteria in your gut that have this enzyme. So you still get some cleavage after you take it. Uh, but uh, uh, the best thing to do is is to uh, make sure the enzyme in the whole food stays active. So does that, that short steam then, is the enzyme still still somewhat active then? Um, I know uh, yeah, I, raw I, Brussels, Brussels sprouts may uh, be hard I, for some people. Yeah, no, uh, that's uh, why we chose those conditions for our, our volunteers. Two minutes of light steaming seems to have, seems to have a minimal effect on uh, degradation of the enzyme. Um, and then circling back to the supplements again, um, are most of these supplements given orally? Is there any evidence that you know, an IV, IV um, dose is, might be of benefit or any studies around that? Uh, there hasn't been uh, many uh, studies of, of IV administration. There have been just some studies with 
uh, IV administration of indole-free carbonyl, uh, just to see what the role of formation of DIM in the gut is. So if you take, if you give it IV, of course you're bypassing the stomach, and the indole-3 carbonyl is not uh, degraded at the same way as in the stomach. And uh, most of the studies I've seen that have done that have not seen the same beneficial effect uh, that you get orally. So uh, it seems like the, the formation of the compounds in the stomach, the, these dimers, uh, the dimer of DIM especially, and then some of the others perhaps are critical in, in, in the beneficial, beneficial effect of, of indole-3 carbonyl. Um, I'm going to circle back to the food preparation. There seems to be a, a flurry of follow-up questions uh, from, your, from your answer there in terms of you know, cooked versus raw. Um, but uh, in terms of type, is there any difference in terms of type of cooking? If there's a question about whether or not you microwave it or if you chop it um, uh, to, you know, to release the, the enzymes, if, if that makes a difference, uh, freezing, uh, you know, frozen uh, food versus uh, fresh food. Do you have any comments on that as well? Uh, yeah, as far as the method of cooking, I think the general rule is the, uh, the quicker and, and probably the, the lower temperature methods are, are, are probably the best in keeping that enzyme active. Uh, freezing doesn't seem to have any particular effect on uh, degradation of the enzyme. You can freeze the Brussels sprouts, for example, for quite a while, thaw them out, and they're going to still have the uh, enzyme activity. Uh, what I would do when I was, I was taking, when I was taking Brussels sprouts for this trial was I would uh, take the frozen Brussels sprouts and chop them up uh, into a fine uh, pieces and put them on a salad. And that was uh, really uh, uh, the way I like to do it. And uh, when you chop chop it up, of course, you're, you're helping to release the enzyme too. Uh, the enzyme's normally released when you're chewing the food, but if you chop it up too, it, it, it kind of adds more of the free enzyme to, to be active. So I think that's a good way to go too. Um, at the end of your talk, you talked quite a bit about kind of how genotype uh, may affect um, interactions. Um, can you comment on there is also a genotype that makes people super tasters to cruciferous vegetables. Um, is there any interaction in terms of, of, of those things or any recommendations you have for our, our super tasters out there in terms of getting uh, their uh, uh, dim or indoles? Yeah, and I, I believe I'm one of those people. Uh, I've always had uh, some adverse reactions to the to the smell and the taste of the bitter uh, sulfur compounds. Uh, I've never been genotyped, so I'm, I don't know that for sure. But uh, so uh, the uh, that certainly plays a role in in uh, the uh, uh, how an individual uh, might enjoy or, or like the taste or the smell. Uh, but again, there are other ways you can get the benefits of the Brussels sprouts uh, without uh, cooking it and releasing a lot of the sulfur compounds. Uh, again, frozen pieces into a salad is, is an example, but there are other ways I'm sure people can come up with. Um, so uh, I, that's, I guess, the best answer I can come up with. Do, um, um, do super, if you're a super taster, do you react um, to supplement? You act, I'm sorry, what's it? I mean, if you take a dim supplement, does it have uh, an aversion oh. there? No, no, uh, if you take it as a supplement, you, you're bypassing the olfactory and, and the, the taste. Uh, uh, so it, there's, that doesn't play a role if, if you're taking it uh, orally like that as a supplement. So that could be an option for some of those uh, uh, strong super aversion taste, uh, tasters. <laughs> As well. Yeah, and as I said, I, I, I take uh, 100 milligrams of DIM daily. I also take 600 milligrams of uh, broccoli uh, powder extract. So um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, hedge my bets that way because it's hard for me to get uh, uh, the uh, amount of whole food that I should be getting uh, because of this adverse mm -hmm. reaction to the smell and taste. Um, 
Let's see, let me go through here. Um, so it, how does one find out if they are one of these drug metabolizing um, variants? Yeah, uh, I think uh, as personalized medicine continues to develop, there would be more opportunities for people to be genotyped and find out uh, what the amount of uh, these different enzymes you have in your liver uh, might be. Uh, and that's the information you need to have. Uh, I have a personal uh, knowledge of this because I, I have a condition where I, I have to uh, take uh, opioids for uh, chronic pain. And it turned out I wasn't getting the benefit I should have been getting from uh, the hydrocodone I was taking, that's in Vicodin. And so they wanted me to be genotyped and uh, I had to submit you know, some uh, uh, buccal uh, swab uh, and they did the analysis. And it turned out that uh, with respect to cytochrome P52D6, I was a low metabolizer. I had a little activity, but not that much. And just like the, uh, the uh, grapefruit juice can inhibit the CYP3A4, there are some compounds can that can inhibit the 2D6 uh, uh, activity. Uh, and I was actually taking one of those drugs. It was uh, Wellbutrin or, or, or Bupropion for, uh, uh, and so whatever little activity I had, the 2D6 activity I had was being knocked down by this uh, other drug I was taking. So I was getting no uh, beneficial uh, metabolism to the much more active pain reliever from hydrocodone, which is uh, uh, the hydromorphone. So uh, yeah, uh, but genotyping people right now for these enzymes is not standard procedure. You have to go to a specialized laboratory. You have to have a, a doctor's referral and they're gonna want a good reason why you, you wanna uh, do this. And insurance companies sometimes will question uh, why, what the need for this is. But I think five to 10 years from now, it's going to be pretty standard. They're going to, they're going to know that. Uh, is this individual likely to respond to DIM uh, or not, depending on uh, how it's going to be metabolized in their liver, how it can be impacted by uh, components from other foods? Uh, and it's, I think that's where we're hopefully going, because that's, going to, that's really going to increase the, the potential for nutraceuticals to help individuals, uh, because right now, there's such a wide response between people. If you saw that study that we did, you could you saw just among the six people we had, there was a huge variation, uh, and uh, that's probably mostly from genetics. Um, let's see. There is a specific question about the vitamin C interaction that you talked about, whether or not the scorbutin is made uh, in vitro or in vivo. Uh, well, it. It would probably be made um, mostly uh, after you take it uh, uh, in the stomach. Maybe, yeah, it would have to be mostly in the stomach because again, endol 3 carbonyl uh, is uh, not stable in acid. And so it wants to react with uh, other compounds. Uh, if not itself, then uh, vitamin C is a, good, uh, is a good one to react with. And then you get that coupling between the vitamin C and the endol 3 carbonyl to form this compound called ascorbogen. Uh, and uh, so foods that are high in uh, vitamin C or if you take vitamin C supplement along with a DIM supplement, chances are, I mean, not DIM, but the endol 3 carbonyl, you're likely to be forming ascorbogen uh, in your gut and then absorbed into your bloodstream. And, uh, but as I said, we, we don't have uh, as much information about uh, the health benefit of ascorbogen as I think we need to have. We, we know that it can serve as a reservoir for endo 3 carbonyl because that uh, vitamin C can be cleaved off and regenerate the parent compound, the endo 3 carbonyl. So maybe it's, it, it prolongs the, the uh, effect of endo 3 carbonyl because it, it can act as a storage reservoir, but we don't even really know that very well. But it seems like ascorbogen, there's some, some information that it has a beneficial effect for a number of different diseases and especially cancer. Uh, and it seems like with breast cancer, it may be operating the same way. It's, it's uh, increasing the metabolism and, and lowering the, the levels of, of estrogens. 
we've got a couple more food questions again uh, for you. So uh, two, uh, one is, is there any difference um, in terms of uh, organic versus conventionally grown um, Brussels sprouts or cruciferous vegetables? Um, and then the second question is, what about making um, smoothies or putting them in, in a, a smoothie? Would that be an effective way? A Brussels sprout smoothie, wow. <laughs> uh, I, I, that just a thought kind of scares me. Um, <laughs> as far as, as organic versus non-organic, um, in our trial, we used uh, only organic uh, Brussels sprouts and from a particular place so we had that consistency as far as pesticide and the role uh, uh, in this uh, I think under the regu regulations we have now and if the Brussels sprouts are washed uh, before they're uh, used I think the, that issue is probably not as great as some people might think uh, or organic is probably uh, the safer way to go if you can afford buying all organic uh, vegetables, but um, I don't think it's likely to be a, have a big impact. Okay, what about um, microwaving? Well, that's uh, that's how we would often steam, you know, we, we uh, the vegetables, uh, the Brussels sprouts, okay, uh, so microwaving. microwaving yeah, microwaving seems to be just fine. Um, that's a fine way to prepare it. Well, I have just looking at our time, I'll ask one more question. Um, and it's, I guess, back to the PAH or the BAPs um, in terms of the interactions with uh, these, these compounds. And in particular, uh, what about using these cruciferous vegetables in high pollution areas, uh, uh, would that be of benefit? You know, people that live in inner cities or you know, areas of the world that have high exposures to these compounds through pollution? Um, or is there, um, do they get some of these compounds in their diet as well? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question because uh, the estimate we have now is that 95% or more of the benzpyrene we're exposed to every day is in our diet. I mean, people know, a lot of people know that these compounds are formed uh, when meat is cooked, especially if it's a, if it's a charcoal grill uh, preparation. Um, but it turns out that, that uh, these compounds are in almost every component of our diet. They're, they can be high in grains, they can be high in vegetables, uh, fruits, dairy products. Uh, as well as meat. So people on vegetarian diets really don't reduce their levels uh, that much, if, if at all. Uh, so you can, you can help mitigate that uh, impact with diet if you can get vegetables that are grown in areas of low benzpyrene pollution. Because what happens is it, when it gets released in the air, it settles on particles into the earth. It's taken up by the plants and uh, and of course, then the animals that eat the plants. But so the further are you away, you are away from the source, probably the better as far as your your uh, intake. So if 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 you have a garden plot, for example, that's not anywhere near a, a freeway or a high source of, of air pollution, then that's probably the the ideal thing as far as lowering your your levels. And, and certainly with cooking, uh, it's been shown that with uh, uh, oven broiled or pan fried, there's a lot less. Uh, form than if if you uh, uh, grill it outside with charcoal or uh, even if the gas flame if the gas flame is close to the meat. So that's that's uh, that's my take on that. It's all interconnected and complicated. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Williams, for your expertise. Yeah, I, I, um, unfortunately, as the questions continue to come in, we're kind of running out of time. So uh, yeah, thank you for coming out today.
so before we go, I just want to mention again a damn proud day. For those of you who are not familiar with Oregon State University, uh, the beaver is our, our, our mascot. So that's where the, the damn um, proud day comes from. But just again, that final shout out on April 27th, um, love to have your support to make damn proud day a success for us, uh, whether it's donations or uh, gift matches or just getting the word out that uh, we are uh, looking for for fundraising uh, so if you need information just feel free to e email us uh, at lpi at oregonstate.edu um, and feel free to email us for um, any of your questions not just about Dan proud day if you uh, have uh, more questions we'll be sending out some follow-ups um, to all the registrants in terms of the this particular presentation and some resources i did want to give a shout out to the micronutrient information center as well uh, we actually do have a, a resource on nutrient and drug interactions as well, um, in addition to lots of information about uh, cruciferous vegetables and bioactives as, as well. So please uh, check that out. Yeah, I'm actually dropping the link to our cruciferous vegetables page into the chat right now. Uh, we are going to actually provide the links to not only the cruciferous vegetable page, um, the uh, I3C page and uh, the isothiocyanate page, all relevant information to what Dr. Williams talked about today. Um, but with that, we're going to have to bring this webinar to a close. Um, we are currently planning our next uh, webinar, so we'll have an announcement for that shortly. Um, but if you have any questions or suggestions, and of course, last time we did this, um, this, we, we followed up with a newsletter article about uh, some of the questions that we did not get to. Uh, so uh, we hope to do that again, and hopefully we'll see some more information about this topic uh, and some of your questions in our newsletter. Just go ahead and send them. Um, but uh, if you have any, any more comments on this webinar series, just let us know. Thanks all for spending time with us today. Stay healthy and well. Bye. Bye.